speak to you today? Does God want to hear what is on your heart? Can you be sure that he hears your voice among all the other voices he must hear? Welcome, I'm Gwen Falo, your host for Passport to Heaven. And yes, I want to encourage you to believe that God can speak to you through his word. And he wants to hear your heart's desires and your cries and hope for deliverance. So when we pray together, we have each other as witnesses before his throne of mercy and grace. Because of his son, Jesus Christ, we are able to come to his throne boldly. So please call this number for prayer. It is 513-279-2712. And now what I would like to propose is that you understand why I'm doing this. First of all, I want you to know the title again is Passport to Heaven. My name is Gwen Falo, and I have on the screen my number and my email address. It's a Gmail, God's Passport to Heaven at gmail.com. And to get to this particular channel, you would have to type out www.ustream.tv slash channel slash Passport to Heaven. I also would like to say that I'm available for speaking engagements for your youth and women ministries to evangelize and to build up the body of Christ through God's word and prayer and to encourage believers to use their gifts for God's kingdom. So what I'd like to propose now is that we start in prayer. And if you have a Bible with you, I would like you to open because one of the things I like to do is pray with God's word right in front of me. So I would encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with me and today I'm going to be praying from John chapter 16, starting with verse 8. So Lord, I am so grateful to be here today with friends and those who are watching and listening through the internet. I am extremely thankful. And we want to come before your throne boldly. And what we want is to say, Lord Jesus, speak to us today through your word. We want to hear your voice. We want to have open hearts, open minds to receive from you what you want us to receive. So Lord, if there's any unconfessed sin, please enable us to see it and confess it. It's truly a gift, Lord. And for that to take place, it's all due to your Holy Spirit. And according to verse 8, Lord, you have said that you would send us the Spirit who would convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because we do not believe in you. And concerning righteousness because you've gone to the Father and we no longer behold you. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So Lord, we ask that we would be sensitive to our sin, to your righteousness, and to the truth that there will be a judgment. And Lord, you also said that when the spirit of truth comes, he would guide us into all truth. 
and that he would not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he would speak and he would disclose to us what is to come. So, Lord, we ask that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We want to know what you want to disclose to us as to what is to come. And we just thank you that the Holy Spirit was sent to glorify you and that he will take of yours and disclose it to us. All things that the Father has are mine, you said. Therefore, you said that he takes the mine and will disclose it to you. So right here in these three verses of John 16, 13, 14, and 15, you used the word disclose. We want to be vessels who hear you clearly, Lord. We don't want any hindrance. So thank you for hearing this prayer, and I'm asking you to inspire me so that I can share with those who are watching and listening what you've put on my heart. So it's in Jesus' name I pray this with my friends. So the first thing I want to talk about is this painting behind me and why I painted it. The title of this particular painting is based from a verse in Matthew chapter 18. And I used the verse to stimulate part of the whole thinking process when looking at this painting. So the title is, See to it that you do not despise one of these little ones. And what I would like to do is take you and look at Matthew 18. And I would like to read it to you. And again, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to follow along with me because this particular passage is what really is the inspiration to this painting. So starting in chapter 18 of Matthew, I would like to read and I would like you to listen, starting with verse 1. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he is drowned in the depth of the sea. Pretty heavy words that Jesus has just spoken. And I have someone who's written in a question from the chat section and if you're obviously watching me, you can see on your screen to the right, at the right top hand, there's a word written chat. So if you have any questions, please write me. I may not be able to answer you right away, but I'll see your questions and hopefully by the time we get through, I will have answered your question. And that way we can have a dialogue between us. So the question that was asked is, what do you mean by converted? Very good question. So, Lord, I ask that you would help me answer this question in verse 3 of chapter 18. Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children. Well, what comes to my mind is that to be like a child means that there's a humility, there's an openness, and part of our problem as being an adult is that we certainly have our standards and we can be closed-minded, we can be very opinionated, and to become like a child, that is something that we really don't want to do as an adult. The idea that Jesus is even suggesting this, I'm sure the listeners were a little bit insulted. What are you saying? I have to become like a child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? I could see where this would startle his listeners because in that social context, children were considered, you know, like beneath the majority of the population. Children didn't have any standards of 
high value as they do today in our culture. So for Jesus to actually take a child, as it said, he called a child to himself and set him before them. Jesus is actually showing the public that's watching him how he valued a child. And he's putting them into right in front of them and validating his existence and the importance of being childlike. So I would say, yes, you would have to be converted in your mind to start thinking along the way that Jesus is proposing someone to think. You do have to be somehow converted, a change of attitude, a change of mind. So let's continue. Verse 7 of Matthew 18. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. Verse 9, and if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to say that which was lost. And then Jesus takes a little bit of a turn Somewhat seems to change the subject in verse 12. He says, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 which had not gone astray. Thus it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish is not his will. I have another question that's come in. Could you explain a stumbling block? That's a very good question, and I appreciate your asking it. All right, when Jesus, back in verse 7, said, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. As he is talking about it, he talks about the members of people's bodies. He refers to the hands, he refers to the feet, he refers to the eye. And what happens is, he's warning that if your hands or your feet do something in this context to children, or your eye does something in this context to children, if you read what's going on in the context, remember, he's got a child standing right in front of him as he's talking to the public listening. He's saying it's better you pluck out that eye, you cut off your hands, you cut off your feet, and not be tempted to do evil towards children. And that's in this context, verse 10, where it says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. So here is Jesus being extremely severe and he is showing that children not only are important to God but he is stressing that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my father so it is not something light in Jesus's mind or thinking of how children are treated and we should take this very seriously and again this passage was what I base this particular painting on. And then I want to conclude reading just a little bit further in Matthew chapter 18. If you've just joined us, I'm Gwen Falo. I'm your host for Passport to Heaven. And I just want to continue so you can read along with me. So we're at chapter 18, Matthew, and it's verse 15. And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother. But 
If he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. And what Jesus meant at that time was the Gentiles for the Jews, because his public right now are the Jews, the Gentiles and the tax gatherers were considered as people beneath them and not to be considered and to not be dealt with. So basically, he's saying it's very important if a brother sins. Imagine if Jesus were to talk to us today. Imagine if you have a problem with pornography and you're looking on the computer and you're watching children. You are supporting something as absolutely evil in God's sight. And you need to be held accountable. And you might think, no one sees. But the Lord God in heaven sees. And my friend, when Jesus mentions hell twice, in just a few spaces of verses, he's being serious. You harm a child, you are touching God's eye of complete holiness, and you will have something to deal with at judgment. And I know about this personally, and that's why I would like to talk to you about this painting now. Now that we have the base of scripture, I would like to explain to you that this particular painting, if my producer can hone in on this, this was a black and white photograph that I used to paint this painting behind me. And it's a Flemish painting of the 17th century. And at the time, I did not have it in color. And it wasn't until almost, I think it was almost like three years ago, I actually was able to finally see the painting in its original colors. So when I painted this painting, I didn't know what the, paint, the colors were, so I just made up my own. And what I like to do is I like to take a Jesus that I really um, admire, the, the way it's been painting or the, the subject matter, and modernize it. If you've watched any of my previous videos, you will have seen other paintings that I've used to modernize because what I wanted to express is that sometimes we see Jesus in a painting and we just think, well, that was in the past and those were those people in the past and Jesus is not alive today. But that is completely false. Jesus is alive today. He resurrected from the dead and he is seated on the throne. And so what I have wanted to do is take classical paintings of Jesus and modernize them. So in this particular painting, and I'll again show it to you, at the foot of Jesus is a little angel. And at the time, I did not know it, there were actually four Roman soldiers falling. And in the photograph that I was working from, it was just a black and white, I could barely see three soldiers falling. But if you've been following along my videos, that number three is very significant to me. And it was unbeknownst to me why at the time it was so significant. So here I redid those soldiers in the same position. And instead of soldiers, I modernized and put businessmen. And then instead of the angel at Jesus' feet, I replaced it with this little girl. And what I did was I just went through periodicals and magazines looking for something that would inspire me. And when I came to this particular photograph, I, I, my, my heart went out to her. She's three years old at the time from India, and she's been hired to sew soccer balls with her mother. And at the time, she was earning with her mother 75 cents an hour. And... That photograph was taken by a woman named Marie Dorigny, and this I found in a magazine that also had other articles about child abuse. So I decided to take 
that image of that little girl, replaced the angel, put her there, and in the original photograph there were only the two uh, soccer balls, but I added a third. And it, if you'd asked me at the time, before the year 2000, why did you put a third one there? I would have just said, well, you know, artistic license, and I just wanted the flow. You know, I would have come up with something. What I didn't know was that in my subconscious, there was something much more going on that I was completely unaware of. But God knew. And that's one reason why I want to show my paintings because God used my paintings to start an amazing healing in my life. And that's one of the reasons why I want to talk to you. Because I believe that God wants to heal the body of Christ in a deeper way. And I was a Christian for years. And I had no idea that I needed some kind of inner healing. Actually, what had happened to me was... In 1978-79, I was with some people who were trying to heal me because I had an amazing oppression. And amazing, I don't mean in a good way. It was an oppression that I felt on my face, and it was on my body, and it would come and go. And I, I felt under some evil presence, and I was really afraid. And so I sought out people to help me, and at the time I was in California. And it seemed like I went from one group of people to another, to another, to another, and no one seemed to be able to deliver me. This oppression that I would feel on my body was very frightening. And so finally I came to visit a man with his wife, and while they were praying for me, and I won't go into the actual details right now, but something happened very dramatically, and my memory dislodged from my subconscious came to the front. And it was at that moment, and I've already explained this a little bit in another video, I recalled like it happened yesterday, how in my bedroom at the age of seven or eight, a babysitter had come into my bedroom and molested me. And I remembered seeing it so clearly, as if it was just yesterday. So what did I do? I mean, I had completely blocked that out of my mind. If you had asked me, Gwen, have you ever been sexually abused? I would have said no. Because my mind had completely blocked it away. One reason was because it happened while I was sleeping. And what I could remember at that instance was that it happened to me three times. So if you watched other videos, you will have noticed in the other paintings there is three. So here I have three men falling, three soccer balls, and these are in black and white. Now in my subconscious, what I was really thinking is, God, you need to judge what has happened to me as a little girl. But I, w I didn't know that's what I was thinking when I was painting this. In fact, I painted this painting 20 years after that memory came to my mind. And as I've also explained, when the memory came to my mind, I cried 10 minutes really hard, and then I put a lid on it and said, that's it. I'm not going to think about this. It's in the past. I'm a Christian. I forgive. Well, you can say you forgive if you remember this much and you felt this much pain. Yes, you can forgive. But what God saw in my heart and in my mind was all this pain and all this need for forgiveness that I wasn't dealing with. Because I wanted to hide behind a veneer of, well, I'm a Christian now and, oh, that, that happened and that's in the past, but I'm not going to think about it. Here it is 20 years later, friends. And my subconscious is thinking about it. But I wasn't. No, I was thinking of this little girl in India sewing soccer balls and, oh, this is horrible, which it is. It is awful. But it was the little girl inside me who was identifying with this little girl. The little white girl was identifying with this 
dark-skinned girl. Why? Because she was rejected. She was unloved. She was being used and abused. And I identified with that. And like most children, when there has been sexual molestation, there's this sense of somehow I'm the one that's responsible. I'm guilty. I'm evil for this to have happened to me. So I must be really black and dark and ugly and, and worthless. And children also think it's up to them to fix it. So here she's got a little thread in her hands, three soccer balls that she's supposed to fix. Do you see how amazingly deep that is, that God was enabling me, unbeknownst to me, to bring out truth. You know, Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. And I did not have the full truth, my friend. That's why I want to encourage you. Let God's word penetrate into your heart. Let it be something that you want to read every day. There was a survey taken, and it said that the Christians who read their Bible three days or less were no different from those who didn't read it at all. <laughs> so if you're staying there, you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, Gwen, you know, I read it when I go to church and I go to a Bible study and yes, I have a devotional and there's a little verse there that I read and that's all I do is three times a week. I'm telling you, with all the influence of the world, you're not doing very much to counteract that influence, counteract the culture in order to be truly a disciple of Jesus Christ. So a question has just been sent to me. How do I get to a Bible study? Well, I'm going to pray right now for you. Lord, someone has just asked how they can get to a Bible study. And something that I pray every time I've moved. Lord, you know where I can go to find believers who can encourage and support me. So I pray this for this person. If they need to find a Bible study, if they need to find a church, Lord, lead them to that church. Lead them to that Bible study and enable them to sense that this is the direction they're to take. And if they don't have a peace, then Lord, just help them keep looking. And thank you, Lord, that you are more concerned than we are about finding a church and about being with believers. And that we can trust you, that if we ask you, lead me, Lord. You are the shepherd. You said, I shall not want. You said that you would make me lie down in green pastures. You said that you would lead me beside quiet waters. And you said you'd restore my soul. So, Lord, if we ask you to lead us to believers who can encourage and inspire us and teach us your word, you'll do that. So I pray that you will prove your faithfulness to this person and to anyone who's listening to me today, that you will prove your faithfulness. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. That's what I do, my friends. I pray about everything. You know, it's just so freeing to pray about everything. Do you ever have a thought and you're worried about something? Just bring it to the Lord in prayer. It's so easy. And then God can give you that peace that surpasses all understanding. So back to this painting. Jesus is in a resurrected body, and he's coming as judge. He's got his right hand lifted up, the sign of judgment. And we have three businessmen who are falling. And if you notice, this little girl is not that little angel by his foot. She takes a pretty large part of the painting. Now, if you'd asked me before the year 2000 when all my paintings came alive, and that's what I want to eventually explain what, when this painting came alive, what happened. But if you had asked me, why is she so big, you know, uh, compared to Jesus? And that's because, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know she was representing me and my pain and my suffering, which was big. See, I was hiding that all from myself. 
And so if you had asked me, why did you make her so big? I would just, I wouldn't have really known. Oh, I just thought, you know, she's in the center and, you know, I would have given some, you know, artistic, you know, see, there's a triangle and keeps your eye moving around and, you know, she's kind of off center. That's good balance. Yeah, I would have come up with something like that. And yet God had a deeper meaning for me. So I want to explain to you what happened. This one day in the year 2000, I was sitting, I was praying, I was looking at a particular painting, and all of a sudden faces came out from those paintings that were not the faces that were of the painting. And so I looked at every single painting. It was as if God removed the curtain. He removed the veil so I could actually see what my subconscious was really seeing. And so when I looked at this painting, and I'm telling you, I was weeping. I was crying. It was like I was mesmerized by this vision-type experience, and I knew it was spiritual, but I couldn't grasp exactly why it was happening to me, but I knew that there was a message to me from the Lord and that this was me and that what this was representing were the three times that I had been sexually abused, that I had tried to forget. That's what it meant. And that I had this amazingly sorrowful attitude of, is there anybody who cares about me? Is there anyone who cares about me? Because she's feeling alone here. And I want to say to you, my friend, Jesus cares about you. You might feel alone in your misery or in the traumas that you went through. Jesus cares about you. And he wants to reveal to you that he wants to heal you if you give your life to him. So I have a question. I don't understand. How can you hide things from yourself? Thank you. That's a really good question. I don't know how I hid this from myself. I just did. It's called, in psychological terms, denial. Our mind, in order to survive certain traumatic experiences, will put it in the back of our mind, and it will be closed. It's like there's a guardian between the subconscious and the conscious. And that guardian will not allow certain memories to come to the frontal, to our conscious, because it's too painful. And so that's why a lot of people who have been victimized, um, abused, often actually forget it completely, like I did. And then something will trigger it. As in my situation, it was triggered by an, an unusual experience. And the memory just came back. And what is odd is it is so real. It's as if that memory happened just the day before. So the intensity of that pain is right there in front of you. But because I'm an adult, at the time I was an adult, I had the power to squelch it. And I did that as a survival technique. And that's basically what children will do. Now, if it's a repetitive thing, if the abuse has continued, in my case it was three times, but if it's a repetitive thing, most of the time then those children do not forget. I have a very dear friend who is an incest victim from a very early age until she finally fled from the house at 18. There was no way she could block that memory. That was excruciating pain for her. It was her own father committing incest, so she could not be in denial about it. But what can happen is we can deny how that hurt us. We can deny the suffering we went through. We can minimize it. And then if we do that, we're not allowing ourselves to feel any pain. And what goes along with pain, yes, it's the suffering, but there's also the anger. Because as an adult, what I ended up feeling was extreme anger. Once this came alive with all the other paintings, I not only felt the, the grief, but I felt the anger, which I've explained prior to this session. And so here you don't see that anger except in Jesus, do something. <laughs> That's where the anger is shown.
So I wanted to read to you a verse that's in Acts 10.42. Jesus Christ is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. And so, again, Jesus here is represented as the risen Savior and, as I mentioned, indicated by his right hand lifted up, held up high, he has the authority to judge. And he will return one day, just as he said, and he will judge those who have abused anyone or manipulated anyone, especially children. So I have another question. I have been abused. How do I overcome this wound? I am so touched that you've written that to me. <laughs> you know, I thank you that you're open, first of all, that you are admitting to me that you've been abused and that you want to overcome that wound. Have you told anybody else about this or have you kept it a secret? What I'm hoping is, my friend, dear friend, that you'll tell somebody if you have not and that you will tell believing, caring Christians who can start to pray for you. And then you can ask God, please, Lord, heal me. And he will do it. Now, it's not going to be microwave. I mean, we're into this culture of, you know, the tea, quick, microwave, it's done, you know. That's not necessarily how God may heal you. He may want to take you through a process. And so I encourage you to not dismay. And I'd like to pray for you right now. Lord, I'd like to lift up this person before your throne of mercy and grace. And if there's anyone else who's watching this who has also been abused and they need to be healed, they want to overcome this wound, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would reach out to them, that you would console them, that you would comfort them, and that you would bring people into their lives that they can trust, that they can open up to, who can pray for them and enable them to sense your warmth, your love, your compassion, your understanding, and that they can receive healing. And Lord, I also pray for anyone who's listening, and especially this person, that often, obviously, if we've been abused, we are dealing with vengeance, as in this painting. And it's a normal thing, and it's something very healthy to admit to. I want vengeance. I am angry. I was assaulted. And that is part of our dignity, since we've been created in the image of God. So, Lord, I also pray for this person they would be healed from their anger and their bitterness and their hate and their desire for vengeance. Lord, I ask this in the name of Jesus that you reach out to this person and anyone else who has the same situation that they will be able to have the courage to come out and talk about it. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know... You are a part of healing me. The healing is a process. See, it is healing for me to talk about this. Some people think, oh, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to keep it in the background, you know. I'm going to keep silent because then, then I'll be okay. No, actually, it's like a toxin in your body. It's like cancer. And you're not dealing with it. The best thing you can do to find healing is to talk about it. Do you realize, I painted this in 1998. I had no idea what I was really painting about. The year 2000, it comes alive. Here we are in the year 2013. I am talking to you about it, and I'm not crying. The first time I talked about this was in the year 2008, and it was to a small little youth group of 10. And I was really happy. I didn't cry too much. I was able to keep most of my emotions intact. So do you see how it's been a process for me? And part of it has been to talk about it. And just the simple fact that I can be here before you and tell you about this 
And I have three friends who are watching me as I do this, and they're hearing me as well. See, this is healing for me because that wound is, is being covered by the truth. The truth shall set you free. And if you don't allow the truth come out, you're lying to yourself. And lies never set anyone free. So I have another question. Why do people hurt others the way they do? Don't they care how they hurt others? This is a very good question. What happens? People who hurt others means one thing for sure. They have never felt their own pain. They are in such denial that they're then able to actually commit the same crime or worse to other victims. The victim can then become the aggressor. And that was something I realized about myself. If I didn't find healing, I could be an aggressor. I could take my anger out on someone else. And I thank God that I never was in a situation where I could hurt someone, someone else, until I finally had that deep healing. But it can happen. And I'm very glad you asked that question. So if, you, if anyone is listening to me and you dulled your mind and your heart to your own pain, you need to open up and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to ask you to take away all that hinders me from feeling this pain. And if you pray that prayer, you are on the road to recovery and to healing. And it is, it is a little frightening because no one wants to feel pain. We are in a culture where let's have fun, let's have a party, let's enjoy life. Who wants to think about pain and suffering? And that's why so many people stay in their own little closed environment. And if they see something very negative on the news, oh, change the channel. If they can't handle something out there, you know, a publicity ad or something about children starving somewhere, oh, we just change the channel, turn away from it. Because we, we want to live in our little ivory castles, don't we? We don't want to know of pain out there, let alone our own pain. But I guarantee you, if you get in touch with your own pain, you're going to have Jesus Christ's compassion for other people's pain. And if you allow him to heal you, he'll use you to heal someone else. This is exciting. So Hebrews 4, 7 says this. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And that's a temptation, my friend. You're hearing what I'm saying, and maybe right now you're real open to me or open to the Holy Spirit. And then when this broadcast is over, all of a sudden a huge wall goes right up. And you say, mm -mm, I'm not going to go that way. If you do not seek healing, listen to what a counselor told me. Gwen, she said, if you do not seek what is really at the root of your pain, if you don't open yourself up, and allow God to heal you, you are going to let your body then speak. And you may develop cancer. You might develop some kind of disease, some kind of blood disease, because what we're doing is we're letting something that was not meant to be in our body take residence and occupy and become a part of a cancerous growth. So if you don't allow your emotions to come out and you listen to those emotions. Emotions are from God. You know, it's okay to say to God, I am hurting. If you are with some Christians who say, oh, you should rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. They're not really taking into context what Paul said just the chapter prior to that chapter 4 of Philippians. Chapter 3, God, he wrote and said, that God had mercy not only on him because he would have had sorrow upon sorrow, but that he healed a man, Epaphroditus, who was sick. And it wasn't clear at all. It just, 
you just read it and you realize that Paul wasn't able to heal him instantaneously like he had been able to do earlier in his ministry. So read Philippians chapter 3, and you'll see that Paul said, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. See, feelings are healthy. We live in a culture where we want to deny our feelings. And even anger is healthy. To admit to God, I'm angry. Please help me. I don't want this anger. Take it away. How can you ask God to take away something if you don't even admit you have it? So admit to God you're angry. He's not going to send a lightning bolt because you admit that you're angry. This is part of being a human being. We have been aggressed. We've been hurt. Take that truth to God and let him heal you. All right. Now, something else I wanted to share with you today. And we just have a few more minutes before this session ends. And this is deep on my heart. This is child abuse. Okay? This is where we're... Where Third world countries are using their children for financial gain. And then there's wealthy countries like the United States taking advantage of it. Europe, there's a lot of countries doing this, obviously. So I want to speak to businessmen who think they can get away with this. One day there is going to be a day of judgment. And you will be held accountable. And there are a lot of Christians who think, but there's not a hell. I know Christians who talk that way. There's not a hell. We're all going to eventually get into heaven. Well, then what you're doing is that you have created another Jesus, another God. And that is called idolatry. You have taken your Jesus and put him up there in heaven. Oh, my Jesus is a Jesus who loves everybody, and he's all forgiving. And if you've done evil, well, it's okay. You really don't need to repent. You really don't need to come to Jesus because in the end, it'll all work out. Everybody's going to get saved. And then there's Christians who say, well, okay, maybe there is judgment, but hell's not for eternity. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said to be cast into the eternal fire. And then later he says to be cast into the fiery hell. It's eternal. You know, I tremble at that idea of hell. And if I had succeeded in any of my attempts of suicide at the age of 20, and I did make futile attempts. If I had succeeded, I did not know Jesus Christ. I had never asked Jesus to forgive my sins. I would have died and gone to hell. And that's where I would have deserved to have gone. And I waved the white flag. There's some of you out there that say, oh, well, I'm a good person. You're fooling yourself. If you compare yourself to the lowest of the low or to someone in prison, oh, I'm a good person compared to him or to her. Okay. Yeah, in your own eyes, you're a good person. But who sets the standard? It's not you. You're fooling yourself. It's God who sets the standard. And he will not let anyone come into his kingdom if they're not covered with the forgiveness that Jesus Christ gives. By dying on the cross and allowing his blood to sh be shed. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now I have a question here. Won't Jesus always give you another chance? Well, if you know Jesus, that's the crux of the question. Do you know Jesus? Because you might be saying, well, I know Jesus. And then you go and you continue doing whatever you're doing and you know it's wrong. Well, you're only fooling yourself. And Jesus said, on that day, there will be many who will say to me, Lord, Lord. Interesting. They are actually talking to Jesus and calling him Lord. Didn't we do many wonders in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Uh, didn't we, you know, on and on? And Jesus says, something very frightening. 
I and never knew you. Depart from me, you who commit lawlessness. Lawlessness. No laws, no commitment to a law. Lawlessness. That is a pretty obvious answer that Jesus never knew you. So we are to examine ourselves and see if we are in the faith. Now, if you are in the faith, you have examined yourself, you truly have repented of your sins, and you truly ask Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you fall, well, we have a wonderful advocate, Jesus Christ. And we come to him, and it's written, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. That's his promise. So... How can we be sure, though, that we're a Christian? That is between you and the Lord, and that's why I encourage you. You need to be held accountable. If you're a loner, if you're an isolated person, you say, yes, I believe in Jesus, but you don't have any believers in your life who are holding you accountable, to whom you open up and ask for prayer, you're in a pretty, you're in a risky state. And I would really encourage you, like someone had written in earlier, find other believers, find a church, so that you can be held accountable. So if you stumble, you can confess it to God, and then you can confess it to a friend or two or three. And if it's a reoccurring problem, you need to ask them to pray for you, and you will overcome this sin in your life. A Christian who lets their flesh take control is squelching the Holy Spirit and that is that is obviously a cardinal Christian and you're not going to grow and you're not going to benefit from all that God wants to give you and all that he wants to heal you from and how he wants to use you so if you sin yes confess it right away I sin in my thoughts all the time so I'm always you know checking in with God saying oh God please forgive me that thought you know, they just come in and, oh, how could I have thought that? You know, I confess it. I tell God, I'm sorry, please take it away. All right, so one other thing I want to say to you. This is obviously child abuse. But our country is doing another abuse that is far worse than we could ever really imagine. And that is killing babies in the womb. That is the ultimate child abuse. And I would like to tell you that I wrote to my, Senate, my representative and also the senator, and I would encourage you to do the same. H.R. 1797 was the plan, the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. It was passed this week. So imagine. Our country is allowing abortion to take place. But at least now we're saying we don't want the unborn baby to suffer the incredible pain that that unborn child suffers. And I thank God that this act was packed, passed. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you forgive this nation for committing this ultimate child abuse on the children that you have given us. Forgive us, Lord, for we truly are guilty before you. In Jesus' name. So I have one last question that I'm going to answer. What about the sins we don't know we have committed? That's a good question. I've said that too. I've said this. And so let's end in prayer with this very thought in mind. Okay? Lord, I want to thank you for this time that we have spent together to discuss sin, to discuss the conviction of it, to discuss the Holy Spirit who brings to our mind past sins, past wounds. And what I'd like to ask you, Lord, and I ask this for myself, if we as a body of believers are not sensitive to sins that we have committed and we're in denial about it, Lord Jesus, we ask for mercy that you would hear our prayer, reveal any unconfessed sin in our hearts and minds, in our deeds, in our actions, in our 
our daily lives, Lord, if we have committed sin and we are unaware of it, we're asking you to reveal it to us. And Lord, I ask again that this country, the United States of America, would be sensitized to the sin that's going on in our country of the abortions that go daily, 3,000 on the average a day. And we are desensitized to this criminal act. And I, for one, am guilty. I did this at the age of 16. And I just thank you that you have forgiven me. And Lord, what you have done for me, I would like you to do for the countless women and men out there promoting abortion and participating in it, paying for it. Lord, I ask that what you did for me, you forgave me. And you've also helped me forgive my aggressor. I'm asking you to do this for my countrymen. I love my country, Lord. I've lived out of it for 20 years. I'm so glad that I'm back. Lord, what you've done for me, I'm asking that you would give this forgiveness to anyone who hears your voice knocking at the door of their hearts. So I quote, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him and he with me. If there's someone who has prayed this prayer, please contact me. And so now I'm going to end this session with a need for financial support, not just for my ministry, but there are going to be other people joining me and doing you streaming TV stations. And we need a video camera that's around 3,500. We need a picture camera that's 82500. We have a need for computers, 3,250. Monitors for computers, $982. We need a faster internet. Uh, one, it's T1 line, $400. And then cables, $200. Light, light team, $1,200. Sony Movie Studio, $920. And then to not have any commercials on Ustream, we need $99 per month per person who does it hourly. So, if you have any nudge by the Holy Spirit to help us in any way, we are many who are trying to get together to come before the audience that's open through the Internet and to reach beyond our borders all the way over to other countries. Please join us financially and especially in your prayers. Be praying for us. Because now that we're entering into the waves of the Internet, we are on the offense against the enemy, who is the prince of the air. And we need your prayer support. So thank you so much, my friend, for listening. And God bless you. And please read the Word of God every day. And write me and tell me any prayer request that you have. God bless you. And streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your children, and my blessing on your descendants.
this one will say, I am the Lord's. And another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord. And will name Israel's name with honor. <laughs>